worship his majesty today with hymn number 297 majesty 297 stand if you can majesty worship his majesty unto who died Jesus who died now glorified King of all kings Amen uh, is my bleed daily walking close to thee let it be dear Lord let it be through this world of toil and snares if I falter Lord who cares who Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. When my feeble life is old. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Mike, we got a walking theme going. You sang last week. I can't even, what was, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. An awesome song. You did an awesome job. Then we just talked about Closer Walk with Jesus, and I'm going to sing a song called I'll Walk with God. Hope this is your commitment in your life. <clears throat>
Today we are continuing our series on the goal of faith. Uh, we're going to be in 1 Peter primarily. If you want to go ahead and turn to 1 Peter. Um, I've titled today's message, The Image Restored. We're actually going to look at uh, the, the end goal, like where, where we're headed to with this. Um, but what's kind of fascinating is when we think about heaven a lot of times we um we kind of fall we can fall into a trap um there's an old saying that somebody might be too heavenly minded to be any earthly good and what i hope today that we'll see is is actually that by uh looking forward to heaven it, we can be more earthly good um that they 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 should work hand in hand um so that's what we're going to look at today and that's why we're looking at first peter i know some of y'all are like if we're preaching about heaven why are we in first peter well that's that'll be clear here in a little bit um, but we will end in uh, Revelation, of course. Um, but I want to open us up in prayer again, and then uh, we, we will begin. Father, again, we thank you for the day. We thank you that you walk with us uh, daily. We thank you that, that even when we've uh, strayed away or whenever we've lagged behind, that, that you were there with us and, and uh, just ushering us along. And so, Father, today as we walk through... Uh, a letter from your servant Peter to to us, the church. I ask that you give us wisdom and understanding. Um, I ask for your Holy Spirit to speak to us today. Lord, I, I, I don't want it to be my words or my message. We want your words and your message to us. And for that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're looking at the end result of our faith. Now, in the beginning of the series, I pose the question, why does God save us? Right? I ask you, have we ever thought about why is it 
that God chooses to save us? And, and the answer we had was he's restoring his, his original design for humanity. And so we looked at in the beginning of Jesus with, it, with design creation, designing humanity, what we were made for. And, and we've kind of walked through that. We looked at mothers on Mother's Day. We looked at fathers on Father's Day. And we've looked at wisdom and how that guides us towards uh, restoring God's image. And, and so today we're looking at the image itself and, and what it means to, to be restored. Um, and then following uh, this week, we're actually going to, we've got about three more. Those of y'all that are concerned that this is going to drag on forever, it's not. We've got about three more um, next week in, in honor of Fourth of July and, and in honor of what God has done through Christ. We're going to look at the freedom that Christ brings to us. Um, and then it's going to get uh, highly, highly practical. The last three have to do with uh, the Holy Spirit's work in the Christian. And then the last two are, are what is it that we are called to do? individually in our context so those of y'all that are like wondering when is this going the end is coming but it's also going to get very practical um which is also when toes get stepped on so those of y'all that are like i want practical no you don't because your toes will get stepped on but anyway but that is coming so it shall come and uh tell everybody it's gonna be fun time um but the image of god in which we were created right it was corrupted by sin so that corruption though it's met its cure with the resurrection of christ and so now whoever believes in the risen Lord shall be saved from that corruption. When we are saved, when we come to Christ and we turn from our sins and we ask for forgiveness, we ask for eternal life, he cleanses us of that corruption and then recreates us into something new. And that's what we're looking at today. So we're going to look at uh, two letters today. First, we're going to kind of uh, skip through First Peter because it's going to remind us of who we are and whose we are. And then, of course, we're going to turn to the end of the Bible and look at um, what is to come. But I'm looking at both of these books because I, I want to reinforce the main point. So those of y'all that might fall asleep, this is the main point, and it's the first point in your bulletin. As Christians saved by the grace of God through surrendering to our Lord Jesus, we are the first fruits of new creation. Anytime somebody comes to Christ, they are now a part of that new creation. Now, we're, we're, we live in a weird kind of limbo area because we know the kingdom of heaven has come to us. We know we've entered the kingdom of heaven when we're saved, but it's, it's just not quite there yet. This isn't quite what we are to expect, and that's, and that's what we're looking at. So we're, we're at the very tip of that heavenly iceberg, or, or like when you think about spring coming, the snow starts to melt, that first flower that you see, those first couple of flowers that start springing in life, that's, that's what we are as Christians. We, we know this, the, a new season, season is coming, but it's just not here yet, and so that. But that's where we are as Christians. So the second point, then, we're going to see through First Peter is that this affects our daily ethic. So, like I said, when you, when we think about heaven, we think about what is to come. It should encourage us to live more godly lives here now, presently, because the second point there, Christians are called to live as though the new creation has come, because we know it is coming. Right? We're not called to continue in our old sinful ways because we're done with that. We, we've moved on from that. We're, we're now looking forward to what is to come. Well, what is to come? Heaven is coming. So, so we're, we're getting ready for what is to come. We're not dealing with what is behind us. And so uh, let's begin reading. We're going to look at 1 Peter 1, and I'm just going to read uh, 3 through 9 to, to begin. Peter writes, Blessed be the, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The goal of our faith is the salvation of our souls. That's where, that's where we're headed towards. And so in verse 3, right, he says, he's caused us to be born again. Now, this phrase is actually one word in Greek, and this is one of those this is one of those examples of why the phrase, it's Greek to me, exists. Because one word, we have to translate in English with about six of them, right? That's just kind of how it works. But the reason I bring this up is, is I, want you, I want you to listen to this word. It's anagenesis, right? Anagenesis. It's easy to say because it sounds similar to a word we already know, right? What does it sound like? Genesis, right? Anna means again. 
right? So Genesis, meaning born again, recreated again. This is what we've been talking about. It's that recreation process that Christ does. Because Christ died, and more importantly, because he resurrected, that new life is available to us. We talk about like John 3, being born again. That's, this is what it means to be born again, that we were something old that was dying and corrupted and sinful, and now because of Christ, we're made something new. That's why Paul calls it a new creation in Christ, that anagenesis. And it just simply means, again, to be, to be born again. And there's, there's, a, uh, there's a whole litany of uh, language nerdism that I wrote down here. But the, the, the bottom line is that it's an act of participle, which gives us that, that cause there. But what's really interesting about it, and I know this won't be interesting to a lot of you, just bear with me. My English major is not here to, to be interested for me. But b- because it's a participle, that means it describes an action, right? And so if you look at that sentence, in English, there's about two or three sentences there. In the Greek, it's actually one giant run-on. And those phrases uh, about being caused to be born again to an inheritance that is imperishable, kept in heaven, who by God's power being guarded, all those phrases are actually describing that first main clause. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is blessed. Why? Because he saved us. Because he's preparing a place for us. Because he has an inheritance for us. He is blessed by our salvation. And that's why I put in your bulletin there, God is honored and glorified in our salvation. He celebrates our salvation. And I I think this is something we we tend to forget because a lot of us remember the old Jonathan Edwards sermon of, of sinners in the hands of an angry God, which is a great sermon, but you walk away from that really loving that Jesus isn't going to kill you now. I mean, that's, that's kind of the mood of the sermon. It's like, praise God, he's not killing me. I mean, that's, for those of y'all that haven't read that sermon, go look it up. It's, it's worth reading. But the problem with that sermon, if there can be such a thing, and, and I know everyone who loves Edwards will hate me for saying that there could possibly be a problem with that sermon, but the problem is sometimes we walk away with this feeling that, that God really just wants to hurt us all and that his wrath is, is, is constantly there. And if it wasn't for Christ, then you know, we would have all been struck by lightning. And what, what, we, what that fails to, to bring into account, and this isn't to discount God's wrath, but it's just a reminder of God's grace, that if God really wanted us all dead, we'd all be dead. But God loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us that despite our sin, despite our rebellion, despite everything we've done to be unworthy of salvation, God celebrates in saving us. That, I mean, that's, that's why it's called good news because God wants to save you. God wants to love you. God wants to do these things and, and grow us into a glorious kingdom that is to come. And it's really it really boils down to what are we willing to let God do in our lives more than what is God willing to do? God's willing to give us eternity. Are we willing to accept that? And that's, that's what we're looking at. So he celebrates our salvation. So our salvation is the subject of both God's and our celebration, right? Peter then turns around and says, this is why we celebrate. We rejoice because, because God rejoices in us. We, we, we weren't just left to our own devices. We weren't left to just destroy ourselves, but God saved us. He intervenes up for us. And then notice how he interjects there, all right, he says in verse 6, In this rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. Right? And why is that? So the tested gen- so it tests our faith. The, the trials of this life, we, it, we, as we live in this limbo of we're, we're in the kingdom, but the kingdom's not quite here yet, those trials that come about are to test the genuineness of our faith. And as we're tested... It, it's, it's like that refiner's fire. It, it makes us better. It draws us closer. So the point there, the trials of life bring us closer to the goal of our faith. And this is, this is why James says rejoice when you get those trials. Those are, those, are, those are actually good things. They don't feel good, but it's, it's actually very good that that's there. I always think back to my ceramic days, right? You get this ball of mud that is pretty much useless. It's just dirt and water. What are you going to do with it, right? But in the hands of a potter, it's shaped, and it, get, it takes form, it, takes, it, it gets useful. But at first, it's very brittle. And, I mean, you let it dry out, and you have to be extremely careful because, I mean, just the least little knock, and that thing's going to fall apart. But what, what does the potter do? He puts it in the fire, he puts it in the kiln, and through that fiery process that I, I, if, I'm sure if the dirt could feel, it would not enjoy it. 
but it's through that process that it's made strong. And then they and then they dip it again. This is really fun to me. They dip it in this goopy liquid stuff that's kind of fun to play with, but you're not really supposed to because there's chemicals in it. Um, but you dip it in there, right? And then when it's dried out, you stick it back in the fire again. It's actually a too, too fiery process. It goes in there, and then when it comes out, it's all shiny, it's beautiful, it's strong as I'll get out. You could, I mean, you can try really hard to break them, but it's kind of hard to. This is why archaeologists love pottery, because they can, you can get all kinds of information, because the stuff lasts forever. And that, but that's what, ha that's what it's going through. That's what we're dealing with with these trials. We're, God has taken the goopy mess that we were, and he's forming us and shaping us. And yes, we have to go through fires, but when we come out of that, I mean, we're just, we're just sparkly and beautiful. That's, that's what's going on here. And that's what Peter says, rejoice in that, right? And as we find ourselves in those, those trials, it's, it's also a reminder that we're, we're just not home yet. We just know this isn't our home. We're not quite there yet. We're on our way, but we're not there yet. So let's read, uh, continue on. We're going to skip down to 13 through 16. Peter writes, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So because we're saved, right, we're prepared, called to prepare our minds for actions, or, or literally it's gird up the loins of your mind. This is a, a phrase that was given to soldiers as they were getting ready to battle. They gotta, they gotta gird up their loins, get their belt ready, get everything ready to go because you're going into battle. And Peter says, when you think about the hope that is to come, use that to prepare yourself because those trials are coming. Like this, this week for some of you is gonna be a horrible week. And, and I hate it for you and, and, and I, yeah, I have so much sympathy for you, but just know that God is working through this week and that there's, there's Sunday's coming. Right, I mean that's that's what we're looking forward to. That even though bad things are going to happen because it's just it's life, we know that God is working through that for our good. So all things that's why Paul writes right for all things work to the good of those who believe. So even even our worst days are under God's sovereign care, and and it's God working in our lives towards His purpose. So and then sometimes as we're kind of dealing with those things, though it can be very easy to return to our former ways. Because it's just it's just an escape from difficulty. We just you just get tired. You're, you're like God. I've been I've been working. I've been serving. I've been trying to do stuff. But I mean, it's hard. And I get that. I trust me. I understand. And but what Peter says here is, they're preparing your minds for action. Be sober minded, right? By setting your hope fully on the grace that is to come. So he, then he he adds, as obedient children, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. So what we're what, what he's talking about is is look as children of God be obedient obey where he's guiding you to and now what what kind of happened and this is this was very much a divine thing this wasn't like I planned this out because I don't plan that far ahead but when we take the idea of, of walking in wisdom and and being obedient to God by learning what it is that God is calling us to right you can be obedient through understanding and that and that helps me because personally I'm one of these guys like I want to know why I was the kid that always asked why why do I have to follow that rule? That's a stupid rule. I don't want to follow that rule. And it's like, well, there's a reason behind that rule. And if I understand the reasoning behind that rule, I'm more likely to follow it. Now, if I don't want to agree with the reason, that's when it gets kind of problematic for me. I'm sure y'all are all perfectly obedient. You never have that problem. But for some of us, when we think it's a dumb rule, we have trouble following it because it's a dumb rule. So, but you can walk in wisdom, right? You can walk in obedience wisely. But then what about those times when you just, you just don't know? You just don't, you don't understand. You've asked God for wisdom. You've asked for understanding. Why, God, why is it that these things are happening? But you haven't quite gotten that answer. Well, Peter says, obey anyway. Right? Walk in obedience because that's what leads to holiness. Sometimes we obey just because God said so, and that's the way it is. And those of y'all that had good parents, at some point in your life, you heard why, and they said what? Because I said so. And it does not matter what your opinion is, right? They said so, and that's the way it is. They're, so, you know, what are you going to do about it? Nothing, because they're your parents, so you, you obey. It's the same way with God, right? There are times he's going to explain to us, okay, this is why I said this, da-da-da-da-da, and you'll be like, oh, okay. But then there's sometimes God's just going to be like, you don't need to know that right now. All you need to do is obey. And so I got the point there in the bulletin. Holiness comes through obedience and wisdom. Holiness. Being holy, being called to holiness, is walking in obedience and walking in wisdom. 
And when you understand, you can say, I'm walking in wisdom. And when you don't understand, you can just say, I'm walking in faith. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey out of faith and because that's, that's what I need to do right now. And it's been amazing to me the number of times where I, I walk and I say, all right, fine, I'll obey. I don't get it, but I'm going to do it. And then later it's like, oh, the light bulb comes out. It's like, oh, that's why. Okay, that makes more sense now. And that's, and that's what God is calling us to. And that's what Peter is saying here. Like, prepare your minds for action. Be sober-minded, right? And as we set our hope on, on the grace that is to come, it helps us to become more obedient because even though I may not under, this, understand the steps from here to there, if I know that there is good and there God is calling me towards heaven and there there is an eternal uh, kingdom that is to come and he's preparing a place for me, if I know that that's the goal I'm heading towards, then I can walk in obedience as I get there, even though I may not understand, you know, what's going on at the time. So, uh, there, so you shall be holy for I am holy. And that, by the way, that's, that's God saying, because, because God is holy, we then are called to holiness. So the next few chapters are going to center around the ethical life that comes through living the transformed life in Christ. First Peter is one of those books I would highly, highly, highly recommend uh, you read slowly through and kind of walk through it, and at some point I'll probably preach through it. But for now, we're going to kind of skip over uh, to chapter 4. And I'm going to read verses 1 and 2, and then I'm going to read, I'm going to skip down to 7 and 8. But 1 and 2, Peter writes, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. And then in verse 7, he says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded. <coughs> the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. So we can look to Christ as an example. He says, since he, Christ has suffered in the flesh, we can arm ourselves with the same way of thinking. Why is it that Christ suffered? Well, he, he suffered for us. He gave himself up for us. It wasn't, it wasn't to his benefit to come and serve and die um, other than he wanted to and he loves us. And so why, why can we suffer at times? Well, it's because we know God is working towards something. Christ came because he's fulfilling the will of God and the plans of God. So we can, we can continue on in our suffering because we know God is doing something. When we know that heaven is on its way, then we can think, you know what, today maybe not be so bad. I mean, if, if this life is just the, the front cover of the book of eternity, maybe it's not so bad after all. You know, I, one of my mom's favorite sayings that she said all the time, and I, and I used to get really annoyed about it, but now it's like, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. She'd always say, and this too shall pass. She'd come complaining, mom, they made fun of me. Well, this too shall pass. Okay, well, that doesn't help, but, but it does, right? Because we know that all things are temporary. So the suffering that we're dealing with is temporary. It will end. There, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. We, we will not stay in our sufferings forever. And so, no, today might not be a great day, but we know that tomorrow can be better because Christ has come, Christ has redeemed us, and he's preparing a place for us. And so even when we're in that valley of the shadow of death, we, no, we don't we need to fear evil because the Lord is our shepherd. And he is guiding us towards eternity. So um, wisdom and obedience helps us to know how to pray, right? In verse 7, I wanted to bring that out uh, because notice in uh, verse 7, he says, right, be sober-minded again. He's, he repeats that. Hopefully you all have caught that. He repeats that a lot. It, it's because it's, it's important, right? Be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers, right? How do we, how do we know how to pray? Because we, we take captive of our thoughts and we think to ourselves, what is it that God is trying to do? What is it that God wills for me right now? And I want to pray for that will. And as, and as you th take captive of those, those worrisome thoughts, then you're able to, to know what God is calling you to and be obedient with that. Just as uh, kind of a, a side note, because um, I, I kind of skipped through, I just realized I kind of skipped through that in here. But that sober-minded, uh, a lot of times instantly when we think of sober, we think, well, you shouldn't drink alcohol. And, and of course, you shouldn't be drunk. Um, it's don't be drunk. I, we covered that. In case nobody told you, don't be a drunkard. But when you look at what Peter's writing here, he's not talking about alcohol. He's actually talking about worry. He's talking about that, that worrisome mindfulness that we get. 
We get so wrapped up in what, what's going on, our trials, our suffering. We get worried about what pagans being pagans. We get worried about uh, you know, lying politicians that continue to lie to us. We get worried about all these things in this world that's really just, it's just reminders that we live in a sinful world. What happens when we start worrying about that is we lose track of what God is doing. And we start, we start thinking maybe, maybe this suffering is going to go on forever. And what Peter is saying is, no, it's not. God's doing something. There is, there is a hope for our salvation that is coming. There's an inheritance that's coming that will last forever, that is the end of sin. And if we continue to worry about sinful people being sinful, you're going to lose track of that. And so being sober-minded, as far as in this context, is Peter saying, stop worrying so much. Stop, stop having anxiety about things you have no control over. Be, be, prepare for what God is doing in your life and be prepared by focusing your mind on the things of God again this is why Paul said focus your mind on the things of God think of heavenly things don't think of earthly things if you, if you start worrying about earthly things you're going to get distracted and you're going to be useless and it's just going to be you're going to have heart problems and all sorts of stuff right focus on what God is doing don't worry about what the sinners are doing because I don't know if y'all notice this or not, but sinners sin all the time. That's just what they do. So, and y'all sin too. You know, just saying. But anyway, so wisdom and obedience helps us know how to pray, which then helps us to know how to serve. And then that's those following verses are actually Peter's version of the spiritual gifts. And Peter talks about, you know, if you if you speak well, good. Speak the oracles of God. If you serve, serve well, et cetera, et cetera. So you can kind of look at those things. But I love verse seven because Peter just puts it so plainly. The end of all things is at hand. Right, the end is. It's like Peter's got that big billboard. The end is near. The end is nigh. So, stop worrying so much. I love that, right? Because we all you see that guy. He's like, the end is nigh, and so we should all freak out because the end is here. And Peter's like, yeah, the end's coming, but that's a good thing. So don't worry about it. So just throwing that out there. Anyway, all right, last bit before I get too sidetracked. First Peter, uh, we're gonna go down to chapter five, and uh, we're gonna read uh, six through eleven. So he says, Peter writes, humble yourselves, therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you, to him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And all God's people said, make sure you're paying attention. This is the good news. Uh, some of y'all look like this is bad news. Get, get ready. Jesus is coming. So we resist worry right, by remembering who Christ is and what Christ has done and what Christ is doing. Right? Verse 8 reminds us that the, the, don't let the devil lie to you. Right? We, we always see this as he's prowling around and, and we think of him like, like this uh, cloaked figure with, you know, like a, ready to mug somebody or kill somebody. But he's, he's not that. He's just, he's the suave guy that's just there to lie to you and just, and just ease you in the wrong direction. The devil never comes out and says, I'm the devil, lie. Right? He's always come, he always comes out as, as an angel of light. He presents himself as somebody worth listening to. You can trust him. He's a good looking guy. He's got white teeth, right? This is, this is what the devil does. Right? He, he never comes out and just shows all his cards. Because if he did, we would all run and hide, right? Because we'd get it. But what do Christians do? Right? They, they, listen to, they listen to the guy that sounds good. And then he just kind of leads them astray. This is why in Proverbs it talks about the two women. You have wisdom who calls out for life. And then you got the, the adulterous woman who, who calls them into, into folly. And she's, she's very seductive. The devil's very seductive. It always sounds good. Sin always sounds good in the beginning. That's the beginning's not the problem, it's the end. It's the death that it brings. So, so be careful. He says, resist the lie, right? And notice in uh, how he writes that. He says, resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Right? In Peter's context, what he's writing and letting the Christians know is the lie that you seem to be hearing is that you're the only one suffering like this. You're the only ones dealing with hard times. You're the only one dealing with a family that's dysfunctional. You're the only one dealing with uh, some type of drug or alcohol problem. You're the only one dealing with mental issues. You're the only one that's really depressed. Everybody else is fine. You're the one that's having the problems. And what Peter's saying is, no, we all have those problems. This, this whole world is filled with people with problems. 
This is one, this is one of the to me, I didn't even think about this until it started happening. One of the, one of my favorite things about Celebrate Recovery is that everybody comes in knowing we all have problems. And so there's no pretension of I'm okay, you're okay, let's just pretend we're all okay. Because everybody coming in there knows, no, we all jacked up. Right? And but it's freeing that way. Because then you can have that that honesty and that vulnerability. And you can act and then and that's where growth happens. Right? I wish our Sunday schools were like that. Uh, that we just came in knowing, no, we all have problems. None of us have it made. And we just, and we're honest about that. And this isn't like a call for everybody to air out your dirty laundry. It's just an understanding that we all are suffering in some form or capacity. And what, what God wants us to do is be honest with each other because what happens is when we recognize that we're suffering and we say, hey, I'm dealing with this issue in my life, that's when God can call those that have walked that road already and say, well, this, this is how I came through it. This is what God did to help me through it. This is how we help one another. This is why time and time again the Bible talks about the elders leading the younger. The, the, those of y'all that have been around this world a lot longer than the, the youngins, we need you to guide the young people. We need you to, to tell us about the mistakes you've made because they don't need to make the same mistakes. I, I, I saw an example of that in my own family. I'm, I'm watching my nieces and nephews, and I'm just like, oh, my gosh. Let me let me let me tell y'all how this is gonna play out because I've already been there, right? Like this is I mean this is just it's how it how it's works. So as church people, this is this is why one of the most important things we can do is have those generations talk to each other and share with one another. I think that's why the devil has worked so hard to to break the generations apart. This whole millennial boomer Gen X nonsense. I am firmly convinced this is just a tool of the devil so we don't talk to each other, um, and that's a problem. We should talk to each other. We need to learn from those of y'all that have gone before us. That's a total side note, but anyway. So, but the best promise in the Bible comes in verse 10, right? In verse 10, you can highlight if you need to. It says, and after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. That is a, that is a promise to, to nail on the wall. I don't see that in Hallmark. It should be there, right? The same God who saved you from your past He's the same God who is sovereign over your present, and he's the same God who has restored your future. If you are in Christ, your future is set. There is, there is no need to worry about tomorrow, because if you're in Christ, your tomorrow belongs to him. And he is working his purpose in your life. We, we don't even have to plan it. We just, we, just, we just walk daily obedience with him and let him work that out. And that is a freeing I mean, that is, that is true freedom when I don't have to worry about my future. And, and I'm one of these guys that I always worry about my future. I want to know five, ten years now what we're doing. And one of the things I've learned the last couple of years, God's been like, hey, listen, don't do that because it ain't working out for you. And I was like, okay. So this is where we're at. All right. So, but also this is life that continues on. Again, turn to Revelation 7. Normally when you talk about Revelation, everybody wants to read the last couple of chapters, and rightly so because those are really cool chapters in the Bible. But I want to bring up Revelation 7 because there's there's a portion here that we get we get a glimpse of heaven. And so um, I actually want, I think it was the very first sermon I preached. I preached out of this passage. And, um, and, and, I, and I want us to see just a very specific thing that's in here. But in, in Revelation 7, you've got these, these seals are opened and, and you've got uh, those that are saved out of the different tribes and whatnot. And then in verse 9, you see the great multitude that comes out. Nobody can count them because there's too many of them. They're clothed in white, and they're singing praises to God. But, but pick it up. There's in, uh, and in 13, you have an elder addresses John, and he's like, who are these people? And John's like, I don't know. You know. And, and so he says that these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white. And then in 15, 16, 17, he gives us this song that they sing, or this kind of poetic answer about it. But he says, Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So when we see this great multitude, and, and, and the elder is explaining who these people, he gives us a glimpse of what it's like to be in heaven. And, and as you look through this, a, a lot of times people picture heaven and they think of like, you know, the chubby angels playing the harps or, or we're supposed to just hang out on clouds all day. Um, 
I remember as a teenager, my brother making a comment that he, he doesn't want to go to hell, but he's concerned that heaven's just going to be sitting in a church service 24-7. And I was like, well, I'm pretty sure it'll be a really good service, though. Um, he's like, yeah, I know, but I just can't stand there for a long time. And I was like, I don't think you get heaven, but okay. Uh, and then, but like, you know, you see movies and different things. One of my favorite movies is, is a horrible movie theologically, but What Dreams May Come, where you, the guy gets to paint stuff. It's a good movie, but don't just read your Bible after. Um, but, you know, Christians ponder about what people do in heaven. And then, but these three verses give us a glimpse, right? The first one is, in heaven we serve God day and night in his presence. Verse 15, they, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night. Now, some of y'all might not want to hear this because you're kind of lazy like me, but there's work to do in heaven. Just throwing that out there. You will have a job in heaven. I don't know what job it is, but it'll be a job. It, it'll be a fun job, but just know that you're going to have something to do. Um, I, I made a joke. I was like, you're probably plumbing in heaven. So you probably, there, those of y'all that love plumbing, you, you may have to be a plumber. And Tim, you might be plumbing in heaven. I hope, <laughs> hope you're okay with that. I don't. <laughs> but I don't know. So I don't know what the work is, right? But we serve him day and night. Uh, and there, so there's work to do. Right now, for those, again, those of you that struggle with laziness like me and you're kind of like, I'm not sure how I feel about working for eternity, look at the next verse, right? They don't hunger anymore. They don't thirst anymore. The sun's not on. There's no scorching heat. In heaven, we will not struggle in our existence. That's the point there, right? Here on earth, we work because if you don't work, you don't eat normally. But in heaven, there's no struggle there, right? It's not like it's hard work. It's fun work. It's what, it's what God designed us to do. I mean, whatever that job is, it is what you've been perfectly designed to do, and you get to enjoy it for eternity. So we don't hunger or thirst. We don't suffer environmental conditions, right? Uh, I wrote down, sure we work, but it ain't the kind of work we do down here, right? And then the last there is, in heaven we will know clearly what, what God wills for us. So as the lamb is in the midst of the throne, he's going to be our shepherd. He will guide us to springs of living water, and God's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. Right, Jesus is right there. We walk with him face to face, and we'll know exactly what God has designed for us and what God wills from us because he'll be right there to say, well, this is your job. Have fun. And we'll be like, yes, that's exactly what I want to do. Why didn't I get to do that on earth? Right. So when we find ourselves second-guessing our decisions, our careers, or whatever, in heaven there's no second-guessing. Right. We, we, we are in that new creation, and we're fulfilling the purpose that we've been created to do. Now, as we look forward to that, that calls us back here on earth to know that if, if God or designed humanity with a purpose, right? Adam and Eve were created to tend a garden and to build a civilization. And we know that in, the, in heaven, Christ is going to give us a job. We're going to have a purpose. We're going to have a, a place, a thing to do. What does that say about our present? It says that we're saved on purpose, that there is a purpose for us to fulfill. And so I don't, I don't know that I can tell everybody exactly what your purpose is, but I know that God can. And I know that as we live this life, as God opens up doors for opportunity, as we walk in obedience, that purpose will make sense. And then sometimes the, the time for that is over, and, and we, we move on to the next chapter, and we do a new purposeful thing. But whatever it is that God is calling you to, this, as we go into the time of invitation, this is, this is the time to reflect on that. You know, God, Christ, I know you saved me on purpose. I know you're restoring me to something, and I know in heaven there will be a fulfillment of that, but what is it today that you've called me to? And, and help me to walk obediently today. For some of y'all, that, that means you've got to turn to Christ for the first time. You've never actually surrendered to Jesus. You've never turned from your sin, and you're still living in those old, ignorant ways. And what God is saying is get rid of that. That sin is destroying you, and you won't have a peace of heaven because your sin will drag you to hell. So get rid of it now while you still can. But those of you that are Christians, as you think about the next phase of, of your existence, some, some of you might be coming out of retirement or into retirement. Some of you might be thinking about what, you know, just summer plans. Um, but what is God calling you to in the next phase? Because one thing I know as a church, we've come out of a very difficult time. And we're done with that. The, the time, as far as I'm concerned, the time of COVID is over. We're, we're done with that. You, there's vaccines available. There's stuff. I mean, you take care of it to your conscience, but we're done with that. What is God calling this church to now for the rest of this year? That is what we need to be worried about. And, and as far as what God has done in the past, 
We can celebrate that. We can love that. But what is God calling our future to? But that only works when we as individual Christians are walking in obedience to what God has for us. And that's, and that's what the invitation's about. What is God calling you to today? Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the salvation through your son, Jesus. Lord, I pray for each of us as we, uh, as we just come to grips with the end of, of chapters in our lives, that we, that we look forward to the next chapter, that we celebrate that you are working in us, you're working through us. Lord, I pray for this church as we, as a community of believers, just exhale and, and thank you that you brought us that this far and you brought us out of, 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 of trials. But Lord, we know that more are coming. And so Father, I ask for, it, for your wisdom to, to, and, and, and just walk with us through those just as you've done. But Lord, also help us to be obedient. We ask your Holy Spirit to convict us of where we, we still have those, those sins, whether they be sins of laziness, sins of omission, and just not doing the things that you've called us to. But for some, it might be overt sins that, they, that they're hiding, that they need to, to get rid of because they, they can't serve you fully because they're still holding on to their old lives. Father, help us to get rid of that. Help us to, to understand, as Peter wrote, that the, the, the time for that has passed. And it's time to look forward to the future that you have for us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Number 414. Four fourteen. Stand if you can. Come. 